Well, welcome everyone and welcome to the Faculty Wellness Podcast Series. Uh, I am your host, Dr. Ange Cooper, Assistant Dean of Faculty Wellness. Um, today, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Saunders to the podcast series. Uh, and I just wanted to say a big thank you for offering your time today to do this and for being our first ever speaker. Um, so I wanted just to say a bit about the reasons for the podcast or the aims for the podcast. And that's really uh, what we want to be able to do is invite members of the Faculty of Medicine who might have a personal story that they're willing to share uh, that touches on wellness, burnout, mental health, addiction, vulnerability, humanity or hope and things like that. Uh, it's my belief that one way we can contribute to wellness is through the sharing of real life stories from our very own faculty members that touches upon these areas. I believe that the more we can share stories of challenge and growth, the more we can become a psychologically safe culture. And also the more willing we are to share tough yet vulnerable parts of ourselves, the more we'll feel connected, heard, validated and safe to share. At least that's my hope anyway. So in the spirit of this hope, I would like to welcome you here, David. Um, I heard about you through a number of physicians locally who've been to some of your talks in the past, and they really spoke highly of you and your ability to convey your journey uh, and your story of recovery from addiction. So um, let's begin. Um, maybe we can start by um, you telling us a bit about you, where you're from, and how you made your way into what medicine. Uh, thanks, Angela. Um and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I think it's a uh, an awesome venture that you're starting out with uh, with this podcast, and and I hope it goes really well for you. Um, so nothing complicated with me. Um, I grew up in <coughs> in uh, Dartmouth and uh, lived there through the development years of my life, and uh, I went to high school there, and and uh, then uh, ended up deciding to to make an attempt to to go to medical school and. Started out at, in 1979 at, at uh, Dial Med School and finished, graduated in, 80, in uh, 1984. And, um, and then I've been in general practice since, uh, but in the last uh, 11 years or so, I've moved towards a, a focused practice in addiction medicine. Uh, but I still do uh, maintain uh, some work in, in uh, primary care uh, in my practice in, in, in Dartmouth. Awesome. And what about why? Why medicine? Well, you know, one often uh, ponders about that um, throughout life, about why it happened. Uh, there, It certainly wasn't, uh, you know, from the cradle that I um, decided I wanted to become a physician. But, you know, looking back um, as a kid uh, and still, I, I, I have asthma and I had significant asthma as a kid. Um, and uh, back in those in those um, decades, um, a long time ago, um, treatment wasn't as advanced, advanced as it is now. And, and so I struggled a lot with asthma and was pretty sick a, a few times. So I was, uh, I was exposed to the medical system, to, uh, to hospitals and, and uh, treatments at that time. And I suppose that may have played in, um, you know, somewhat uh, to that decision. Um, all was an interest in sciences. Um, throughout, um, you know, even before high school and through high school, although I certainly didn't didn't excel grade wise in in high school, but but in interest, and so I guess that those are the the two things. There were there there was no medicine in my family. Um, I think I'm the uh, the first physician, you know, in the that I know of in the in the family. Um, so yeah, not not no grandiose uh, things that brought me into it, but those those an interest in science and then maybe that uh, illness as a child that may have uh, pushed me in that direction. Mm, okay. And, you know, so one of the reasons um, why I brought you on the show was because of hearing um, about your journey with alcohol addiction and your journey to recovery through that. And um, yeah, I wonder where we begin the story with that. With addiction? For you. For, for me, well, yeah, yeah. Where did it kind of start? Well, I, you know, living in recovery now and having gone through the things that I needed to go through in order to to recover and and to heal, I've learned a lot about myself and a lot about life and uh, a lot about uh, addiction. Um, you know, um, I've I've 
also studied and learned didactically about addiction as well. Um, but but looking at it from a personal perspective, um, I th- I'm convinced that uh, I started drinking, um, if you will, alcoholically or severe alcohol use disorder wise um, as a as a teen. Uh, I'm I'm convinced that uh, the very first time that I drank with purpose, um, there was a a profound effect. Um, from alcohol on the way that I saw and interpreted the world and interpreted myself in the world um, at, as a 15 year old and uh, and I at that point in time uh, I have no question that uh, that uh, my brain imprinted on on this wonderful and powerful effect that alcohol had at that time and and um, but I mean in terms of progression um, you know, I drank avidly as a teenager, weekends and that kind of thing. Um, in university, in undergraduate university, um, I didn't drink at all during the academic years, uh, during the academic months. But when summer came, um, <clears throat> out came the alcohol again. And and it played a bigger part through medical school, but really was always a constant part of my life. But the real dysfunction started to happen for me um, in my 40s. Uh, and I, and I, and I got sober at 50, uh, at 51. Yeah. So, so that's kind of a, an outline maybe of, of, uh, of, of what it was like. And can you say a little bit about, I mean, you know, different cultures have a lot of different things to say about alcohol, you know, some cultures like maybe here in Nova Scotia, we kind of, we kind of like to have a drink, we like to have a party with drinks, you know, so it's cu- culturally accepted to a certain degree. What was your attraction to alcohol? Like what, how did you feel? What, what did it seem to like solve problems or give you something that you didn't feel you had? Well, yeah, I kind of um, attempted to allude to that in my, in my earlier answer. And I mean, alcohol was part of my, my growing up. I mean, alcohol was around in my family. Um, There was, there wasn't any exposure to, you know, excessive alcohol or drug use in my in my uh, my immediate family or or my extended family, um, but alcohol was part of of my growing up. So I saw the adults drink. I saw, you know, people I guess having fun and relaxing. Um, I didn't have a particular attraction to alcohol um, prior to myself starting drinking. Uh, at fifteen, it, it was available. I, I knew that people drank, and so I guess. Probably I would look, if I look back on it, I would say I, I experimented with alcohol. Um, so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, looking for a benefit from alcohol. Uh, I, I don't recall seeing a benefit from it and saying, hey, maybe that would work in my life. Um, I just recall the first time I drank with purpose. And, and uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, there was a, a dramatic change in, in, in the way I felt. Um, alcohol made me... Uh, able to uh, ask a girl to dance. It gave me the 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 um, the, the strength uh, to be able to, to 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 relax, to be able to dance at a dance. Whereas without alcohol, I would undoubtedly even not go to the high school dance, or if I did, I would hide in the corner and 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 feel embarrassed and and not good enough. Um, alcohol gave me strength. Um, it gave me confidence, um, and in you know, current terminology and the way that when I speak with patients, it, it gave me grounding. It gave me connection. It made me mindful. It, it made me feel comfortable as a kind of a cliche, but it made me comfortable in my own skin. Um, it was a powerful, um, and I don't, I don't think it's excessive to say it was a life altering experience um, uh, for me, you know, and I would have watched peers not like me, um, a drink with control and, and, uh, it would have been no more important to them than a, a hamburger or a, or a chocolate pudding. But for me, it, it became, um, kind of the, the center of, uh, the center of my life. And I, and I progressed to, to base much of my life around, um, having access and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and preparing, um, to, to always have access. Mm. I think a lot of people, I certainly I relate to the use of alcohol to gain confidence. Certainly in university years, I can relate very much from a British culture, which is very normalized in Britain to drink. 
Um, but you mentioned um, that it started to become a problem, uh, more of a problem in your 40s. Um, can you say a little bit about that, why, why it transitioned to being more of a problem at that point? Uh, well, sure. And, I, and I'm not suggesting, uh, I didn't mean to suggest that it didn't cause problems prior to that. I mean, certainly there were individual situations where I drank too much and did things I shouldn't have done and caused problems for myself and for others prior to that. Um, but I, I think in my 40s, I became increasingly uh, daily reliant upon alcohol, whereas prior to that, uh, prior to that, I wasn't. And um, what happens with lots of many people with um, with with addiction, and it was certainly the case for me, was that alcohol was a treatment for me. It was a it, it, it brought me a solution to my, my, my shyness and my inability to interact in the world. So for the first few decades, alcohol wasn't so much a problem. It was, it was a solution. Um, it, it, it helped me to function. And in my 40s, um, there was a gradual transition from it being a solution to being less of a solution and more of a problem as I became more and more dependent upon it. And the, the freedom that I would have gotten earlier in my life from alcohol use um, didn't it wasn't happening to the same extent. So I would still rely upon alcohol to relax and to be able to, to breathe and, and uh, um, you know, after work and in the evening and in order to be able to go to sleep. But it no longer brought the kind of the, the I don't know, the, the happiness or the contentment um, that it may have brought in the earlier decades. So it progressively... Uh, in addition to helping in some ways, it, it actually started to do the opposite uh, as time went on. And, and I would have progressed to the place where, that lots of people speak about where, you know, I couldn't live without it anymore, but I progressively couldn't live with it anymore. And, and, uh, and so I, I needed to find a solution to that, um, which, which, so that started to happen in, in my, in my later forties. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, a lot of people, talk about the moment where the person who has an addiction or is drinking or, or whatever begins to see it as a problem as being a pivotable moment in, in their life where they see it as a problem. Did, did you have kind of like a pivotal moment where you're like, oh my gosh, this has to stop? Or was it a gradual thing? Well, there, there was a few things that happened. Yeah. That, um, Okay, you don't have to say no, obviously. No, I'm just, no, no. Whatever the, you're happy to yeah, share. The, one of one of the pivotal things was um, in my late 40s. Um, I was drinking daily, and and um, at nighttime, um, you know, alcohol never uh, affected in a direct way my work. Um, you know, but I would always drink afterwards, and I needed it to sleep, and became very dependent on it in my late 40s. And and I I uh, took some time off and went out west with my son to visit family and. And uh, one morning, because I was no longer constrained by work, I was I no longer had to be responsible to to my work and to my profession. And so one morning I said, hey, uh, Kate, my daughter, um, you know what, uh, let me let me take Jack, who at that time my grandson was one year old. I said, let me take Jack for a little walk uh, down to Canby Avenue. And so I did. And it turned out there was a liquor store that was open and I was very nervous and shaky that morning and not so much from withdrawal, but, but shaky and nervous from life. Uh, and, uh, and so I proceeded to, to purchase some, some alcohol and, and drank it that morning and, and uh, ended up stumbling and falling while we were out front of her house, um, changing a, a tire on a, on her car. And, and my brother turned to me and said, David, are, what, what's going on? Are you drunk? And it was probably 10 o'clock in the morning. And so that that brought about a kind of a little family mini intervention, <laughs> and and so, soon after that, I I um I went to rehab. I I got convinced by my family and by a absolutely wonderful psychologist, um, who I was going to at the time in Halifax. She she fired me actually at that time and said, David, I can't treat you anymore until you deal with your with your alcoholism. It's it's too sad to watch you, and I can't help you. And so that I. I reluctantly agreed to go to Guelph uh, to rehab and I ended up staying for two weeks and, and decided that I knew more than the, the treatment people, <laughs> um, which of course was not true, and, and went home and, and proceeded to drink for another six months um, and really got to the place where I was ready to die. I had 
I had plans for how I would take my life and, and um, it was a very dark place. And, and um, one day I was driving home from my summer place down in the valley with my son and I couldn't really see because I was crying and, and, uh, and bless the, bless the, the, the boy's heart, you know, for, for being there. Um, but in any case, I, I, on that drive, I couldn't, I couldn't really continue. So I pulled over and I, and this was the days of flip phones. And I, I called my mom and said, um, mom, I think there's a place in the Valley that helps people with alcohol problems. And she looked it up and, um, and, and uh, three or four days later, I ended up at a place up in the Valley, but that, you know, when you ask about a moment, um, I think the real moment was that, was that afternoon in the car where I, I, I was really getting very close to the end of my rope and, and, um, was ready to die and was ready to, you know, transfer care of, and, and care, I would certainly put in quotation marks of my son. Um, at that time, he, he certainly should have been with his mother, but, but he was with me. And, and, and so I think that was probably a turning point that, that, that in the car that day, and I ended up at that rehab and, and, um, and, you know, it, it wasn't all, you know, um, rainbows and, whatever unicorns from there on but but I, I i did stop drinking um as of uh as of the day that i that i went to that place but it, it you know that there's another story about what happened since then but that was kind of that pivotal moment when um when uh, when I, I realized something had to change yeah mm, that's such a powerful story um and 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 one I think probably people have heard the idea of people hitting rock bottom. Uh, and it sounds like that sometimes there seems to be something about needing to hit rock bottom before maybe a change can be made. And and, and did it feel like you had to, or it, I don't know whether you had to get to that place, but, but you got to that place. But something inside of you wanted to carry on. Something inside of you wanted to... Well, heal. absolutely. And, and that's one of the... Um, one of the in, in this profession and in, in trying to be a, 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 a somebody treating people with addiction, it's one of the the great um, mysteries for me is why do some people get to that place and survive when many people get to that place and don't survive? And I and I I I I, I simply don't I don't even have any guesses about that. But but for me, rock bottom, you know, it, it certainly you know I still had a car and I still had a house, you know, and I. And I still had money in the bank right, and I, and right. I, you know, so it's for me, um, but you know, I, for me anyways, it, it wasn't, a, it didn't involve necessarily a, uh, um, a physical thing. Um, for me, rock bottom was a place where I, I realized that I could no longer fix my life um, on my own. Uh, I, it was a, it was like one of the first times in my life that I truly um, was able to transcend self and and ask for help and 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 and, i mean in a real way you know i'd asked for help many times in my life but often it it was when you know i i thought i was in big trouble or or you know sort of like the stories that that we all tell about you know well i i decided to to pray you know um because i needed something um but 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 that wasn't the case here that it was it was a situation where i I, I think I, I got to the place where I realized I could not do this anymore on my own. And so I really had to, um, and I guess when you look back on it, uh, find some form of initial humility by saying, um, I can't do this anymore on my own. And 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 in the treatment world in addiction, you, you know, depending on, on the type of treatment one's talking about, um, uh, initial forays into, into humility – um, simply by asking for help can, can be such a, a very powerful turning point in people's lives. And, and, and it was for me um, on that day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to come to the journey uh, that you took once you ended up in rehab, but um, some of the things you're saying uh, about humility and that change within you that's like, I can't do this on my own. It's kind of like admitting something to yourself, which is very vulnerable that I need to reach for help. And it does make me think of the culture of medicine. Uh, it makes me think of how often that kind of vulnerability, humility is um, driven out of people somehow in the learning process and 
maybe how um, patients want to believe that there is an invulnerable person treating them in some way. Um, that's a big jump to go from a sense of I have to be invulnerable to vulnerability. And 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 um, I don't know what the opposite of humility is, but um, to go from whatever that thing is to humility um, uh, and being humble enough to accept help, that seems like a really important shift, not just in addiction, but just in asking for help in any area, burnout, mental health, wellness. Do you have any sense of that, you know, within the profession too, about how we you know, something about those dynamics of vulnerability and humility as being a physician? Well, I can I can try to comment on that. Um, you know, one of the ways that I look at addiction relative to human existence is that addiction is a microcosm of the macrocosm of, of the human journey. And um, I think people with addiction, um, we get forced um, into finding humility or we die. Um, and, 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 um, and and so, but in, in the world of medicine, you know, and in my personal world of medicine, um, I think, and I think that if you asked my patients now compared to my patients before, um, I, I think that I'm a, a different person now. And I think that I practice medicine. I mean, it, you know, if, if we're talking about uh, the College of Physicians looking at my practice of medicine, it would be basically the same. <laughs> I hope <laughs> um, at least the, the college is still putting up with me, but, 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 it, but in terms of who I am as a physician and what I can bring to the, to the table of healing, um, I think I'm a vastly different physician now than I was before. I think if you had asked my patients 25 years ago, you know, what, what's uh, Saunders really like? Well, he's a bit stuck up and he's a, probably a bit hard to talk to and he and he's very stuck in his ways but you know he's a good diagnostician and and he can prescribe penicillin the same as anybody else so so I kind of got by um but I but I but I think now um um I I'm able and certainly I work predominantly with people with addiction so I, I kind of have an unfair advantage a little bit in that way but but you know I I think humility and in, in medicine is critical, you know, and I think that there's two different ways to look at, you know, what, what, what can, a, what does a physician do? And, and certainly if I'm on the operating table and there's a neurosurgeon about the work on my brain, um, I'm not really going to care whether the guy or the gal or whoever it is has humility or not. I just hope that they know how to use the scalpel. But if, but if I'm sick, you know, and, and I'm on an oncology ward and, and um, I'm not sure whether I have six months or six years to live and somebody's going to, a physician is going to come and talk to me, um, I would like to have a physician that, that, that can bring healing to the table. And, and, and certainly I want the right concoction of chemotherapy, but I also want to have somebody that can meet me where I am, listen to me and, 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 and bring me a sense of confidence a sense of hope, um, bring compassion to the table, um, and 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 uh, and kind of be human, uh, so that so that I can I can, you know, so the physician can can kind of bear witness to to hope and and compassion and 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 trust and maybe even a little bit of uh, a broader sense. Um, and when I say the word in a broad sense, faith, um, and and uh, so I think any physician can. And should <laughs> bring the basics of practicing best practice medicine to the table, um, but I think that many of us, including me, can do a better job at bringing um, of bringing compassion and, and hope and 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 trust and faith uh, to the table. And and I think that takes time for for us in our in our practice to. I think it would be a rare phenomenon early on for physicians, but I, I think that it takes time and it takes years or decades of of trying certain approaches as physicians and, and coming up against walls and then growing and, and personal challenges, I think can, can only help to, to broaden that experience for physicians and make us better doctors. Yeah. That's, that was really awesome. Cause it makes me think about, um, you know, residents who are nearing the end of their studies and coming out into the big bad world of, uh, of work and, and the, um, that it is, there's something about patience and, 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 and growth and how we can encourage growing even in challenging times. And actually these challenging times will be the things that make you the physician 
uh, that you kind of that your patients want you to be in the future rather than it's it's kind of it's not okay to have challenges it's not okay to struggle actually it's part of it it's part of what makes the healing um come alive in a way so tell me so you mentioned healing so um could you say a little bit about your journey to sobriety your healing journey and maybe the components that i mean you've said a lot already but any particular components that really help you um stay sober stay uh, within you know on track within yourself um that you know other people who might be struggling with similar issues could could take something from um sure i mean i can talk about my <clears throat> I'm, and I'm certainly happy to talk about my personal journey. I, I would preface any comments I'll make, though, with with this is my personal journey. Um, it's it's um, you know in in the treatment of of addiction, you know there. <clears throat> when I speak to a patient, I uh, in a consult setting, I, I will say that there's you know there's two basic approaches. Um, one is the medically assisted treatment. Um, you know, so the didactic best practice that, that we might um, look up, you know, through the Canadian Society or American Society of Addiction Medicine or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and, th and then there's the, the psycho-spiritual side of, of, uh, of addiction treatment and addiction recovery. And, and so, you know, I tried for a number of years <clears throat> uh, prior to getting sober. I didn't, I mean, I went to physicians. Uh, I was diagnosed with, with severe um, chronic anxiety disorder. I, I was diagnosed with, um, you know, um, in, in Halifax uh, as requiring ongoing, probably lifelong treatment with SSRIs and benzodiazepines for, for, for my anxiety disorder. Um, and, and, um, and so, and I was on medications and, and I was attending uh, psychologists and, and psychiatrists. Um, and, um, and so I, I delved into medically assisted treatment and, and every psychologist and every psychiatrist were, were wonderful and, and they tried their best and the medications are all appropriate and good and, and were used appropriately, <laughs> but no single treatment or combination of those things, um, helped me. <laughs> um, now I shouldn't, I should rephrase that. They didn't, they didn't bring about recovery for me. They may well have kept me alive, you know, un, until I found the treatment that worked for me. And so, so my personal treatment, my recovery lays in the, in the psycho-spiritual side of addiction treatment, as opposed to the um, medically assisted side. Um, but again, I want to be clear that that's just me. I'm, I'm, uh, I will be forever biased to some extent because, um, uh, you know, I've become happier and more contented and more worthwhile in my life, um, in the last uh, 12 years than I ever was prior to. So I, I am somewhat biased, uh, but in, in my professional life, I have to be non-biased and, and, and recognize that most people that do come into treatment will, will continue in the medically assisted side. And, and I practice that in my work. And, and so, but, but for me, um, I got better by going to rehab um, and by being introduced uh, to 12-step programs and by engaging wholeheartedly in 12-step uh, facilitation. I, I threw my life at it. Uh, I went to hundreds and thousands of meetings. I, I, I eventually, after a year and a half of, of going to meetings but not engaging, I almost relapsed. Um, and, uh, and then I caught on to the message that I had heard in every one of those meetings, which was get a sponsor, engage in, in 12 step work. Um, I, 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 that went in one ear and out the other for 18 months. And, and then I, I did catch on after nearly relapsing at 18 months sober and wholeheartedly engaged in 12 step facilitation with an amazing young man who had recovered obviously before me. He was 21 at the time when, when he took me through the process and it changed my life. It, it, um, it dramatically changed my life um, within a within a three month period, and and so my obsession to drink was just disappeared, and has stayed away ever since. But to answer your question about you know how I stay sober, I continue to engage in in twelve step work. So I sponsor other people, I help other people, 
I've kind of, without realizing it, dedicated a lot of my life to serving my fellows that struggle with addiction. And um, it's clear to me from my own personal experience and from the experience of hundreds and thousands of other people who have recovered the same way that once one recovers through this process, one one can maintain recovery by continue by continuing to dedicate one's a uh, much of one's life to um, thinking of others, helping others, um, and being dedicated to, uh, to to serving other people in whatever way we're, we're asked to to serve. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, and and so 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 that's my own experience. But but again, I'm I'm uh, you know when speaking to others who may listen to this, I'm not saying by any means that that's the only way to get better uh, or even a preferred way. All I can say is that it, it's the way I did it. Yeah. It worked yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's no one-stop approach. Um, I think that's really important to convey that. Um, but it does sound like, I mean, what the sense that I get from when you're talking about recovery and journey and it's very, it feels like it's really from a heart place, like a really deep heartfelt place for yourself and for others. Does that resonate at all? Because it feels really powerful when you're talking from this place. Well, that is absolutely true. And and my, my experience with the process was that um, when I progressed through to the part in the 12-step programs where we go out into the world and make amends to people and institutions that we've, that we've damaged or caused problems, there was a profound and dramatic change in the way that I experienced the world. Um, um, a profound change in the way that I started to experience relationships. Um, I caught on to what most people already know uh, about love, that love isn't something that you go and seek to try to get for yourself. Love is something that you give. And, and when you give um, in a relationship um, of any kind with your heart, then one is rewarded not – on the ground necessarily, well, hopefully in, in that relationship, but one is rewarded internally, almost as though there are genes that are necessary um, for production of the neurochemicals that are necessary to make us feel a sense of belonging and comfort. Um, we do know that those, that those neurochemicals exist in our nucleus accumbens and in our ventral tegmental area. And it's almost as though when when one practices forgiveness and one practices true love and one practices acceptance and tolerance that we're somehow rewarded internally with, uh, uh, with, with normalization of the neurochemicals that are necessary to, uh, to live a human life. And, and so when I look back, I, I think I didn't have normal chemistry <laughs> and, uh, but, but going through this, uh, restorative process, uh, internally, um, uh, maybe I have had normalization of neurochemicals and get to live um, maybe close to 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 a, to a I don't know what's the best way to put it to the life I was meant to live or something like that. Mm. And I guess it makes sense to me that if uh, you're coming from all of these deep places within you, that that fulfills whatever maybe the addiction was trying to fill. Like these things are much bigger. Oh, I have no deeper. question that that's the case. I have no question yeah. that it, that it, in my opinion, that addiction. Um, if if I, in David's world, <laughs> if I was tasked to rename addiction, I would call it lack of grounding syndrome. Um, and and my belief is that people that are born predisposed to addiction use external dopaminergic substances or behaviors. Um, to artificially trick the brain into thinking that it's okay, and that um, and that uh, psycho spiritual recovery is about transitioning from from using external stimuli to internal stimuli, uh, and I and I have no question if, from my own personal experience that 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 that's the that that's the case, uh, and that's certainly certainly what I did. Yeah. And given we know that, you know, certainly a, a addiction of some form is quite significant with, within physicians at large, we, we know that that's a potentially a coping strategy that uh, some physicians use and find. What would you say to somebody who um, 
we're starting to think, you know, I think this is becoming a problem. Uh, it's affecting different aspects of my life. But I'm scared to reach out to anybody. I'm scared. To, I don't know who to turn to. What would you say to that physician member, if you could, were to turn first that might be, or what might you say? There? Well, in, in Nova Scotia, I mean, it's, it's um, I, I would suggest, you know, in a generic sense that they reach out to the physician support program at Doctors Nova Scotia. Um, there's a nice group of um, five, five, approximately five right now physicians, um, all of them who who have uh, some experience in in talking with and helping people with with uh, addictive disorders. Um, it's confidential. Um, it's uh, you know there's no relationship, no direct uh, relationship in any way with the College of Physicians, so it's a safe place to go and 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 talk. Um, there are three physicians, you know, that that do practice addiction medicine, including myself, with within that group at at um, uh, at the physician support program at Doctors Nova Scotia. Um, so that's a good safe, uh, certainly a good safe um, starting place, um, I would suggest. But I mean, in in a generic way, what I, I you know I would suggest to anybody that's 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 struggling, you know, re- reach out to reach out in any way you can. Um, wherever you can, whether it's your, your family doctor or a, or a psychologist that you, that you may know, um, um, and, and, and ask for help and, and direction. I mean, there's wonderful people at, um, you know, addictions and mental health at NSHA, um, wonderful counselors and, and, uh, and knowledgeable physicians. Um, there's a number of different ent- entry places. Um, but, but ultimately it, it comes down to asking for help, but listening, you know, opening your ears and, and listening. And um, if you can f- could find a colleague that has similar experiences, um, that would be really valuable. Um, it's re- physicians, you know, who are struggling, I think do really well speaking with other physicians um, because there are, there are barriers, there, there are ego barriers that we, we carry with us as physicians you know, and there's that that crazy old saying, and I, I don't really, I have to Google it and try to understand it more. Physician heal thyself. I don't know much about that saying, but I, from what, from from my perspective, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, f- physician ask for help. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> yeah, and, reach and, out. And reach out outside yourself. Um, because we can develop our own little sandboxes and barriers that that um you know, that protect us some professionally and personally, but then they can become barriers to healing. And it can be really hard to reach out beyond those those safety barriers that we build up for ourselves as people, but as physicians as well. Oh, absolutely. They're really great recommendations. Um, as the Faculty Wellness Office, we've got really good links with Doctors Nova Scotia. We know how good their peer support program is. And we're also hoping to start quite soon another peer support program as part of the Faculty Wellness Office as well, which is, as you say, where uh, physicians can reach out to other physicians uh, and not necessarily in their own departments, but to reach out to someone who's going to listen and validate their experience it's not about trying to treat it but it's trying to sort of be a first step towards help and everyone needs that first step and if we can encourage people you know if anything we can do from today's discussion uh you know if you're struggling um can you take a first step to reaching out for someone because there will be people who can help and You know, yours really inspires a journey of hope, David, you know, where you were rock bottom and you you made it through, but you couldn't do that on your own. And I think, um, you know, to hear that message is so important when often people think they have to do it on their own, especially the culture of medicine, which can inadvertently present that, uh, that you have to kind of figure this out yourself. And it, it tends to not help anybody. Uh, with with the difficulties so um, it's such an important message that you're that you're speaking here um I'm aware of time maybe go just a couple more minutes um one of the things that the the wellness literature is now saying is um there's sort of been these different phases within wellness and we're on wellness 2.0 uh, and it's kind of all talking about um how physicians can be human 
as opposed to superhuman or superman or superwoman and really talking about vulnerability and, and a lot of the things that you've spoken about today and, um, and humility. Um, and I just wonder if there's any sort of final words that you want to speak, say to that or speak to that, anything, the, in, you know, offerings of hope or just anything that, uh, that comes to mind as we kind of finish up this, um, what's been a really wonderful discussion today. Well, I, I guess in a practical sense, what I would suggest is it's it's good and appropriate as a physician to work hard to excel in in your area of expertise. So, you know, become as as great as you can be in being a, a surgeon or an ophthalmologist or a family doctor and learn your guidelines and and um, you know, be at be at the top of your game uh, from that perspective. But as a human, take some time. Consider taking 10 minutes starting out a day um, to engage in, in something that you might not otherwise think is going to improve you as a physician. So take 10 minutes and learn, learn a little bit about meditation. Take 10 minutes to do uh, a yoga session a day. And then if you can continue with that, maybe expand it a little bit so that maybe a half hour a day or even an hour a day, you can, you can give to a, a practice of some kind. And a practice of some kind on the outside might look like, well, that's like, I've got so many things to do. I got the kids and, and I got horse riding lessons and, and, I, you know, I've, you know, got to scrape the bottom of the, of the sailboat and I don't have time for that. But I would challenge you to, to pick starting out a, th a three month period and dedicate yourself to a um, to a mindfulness practice of some kind. And if after three months of getting yourself to a half an hour a day, you're not noticing a difference at, or you noticing a difference or you haven't had somebody to come up to you and say, you know, have you, have you joined a health club or, you know, are, are you doing something different? You, you look better. You're, you, there's something different in your eyes. There's something about you or a patient that comes to you and says, you know, Dr. XYZ, I've really found in the last couple of times that I've seen you that you've been more relaxed and, and I'm seeing a different side of you than I saw before. And if that doesn't happen, then give up and go back to what you were doing before. But but I think what you may find start to happen is that you start to access a hidden resource within yourself that you didn't know was there. Be it in your in your DNA or wherever it is that I predict and I that there that you will start to access something within yourself that that changes you and 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 starts to turn you into a slightly different person, a slightly different physician that others will will, will appreciate and and that you'll come to appreciate. So so consider consider taking that time and 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 see what happens. As to the practice that you choose, I don't know. Poll the audience. Talk to because it in my opinion it's not so much about the individual practice, um, it's about the practice itself. It, it's about giving yourself up to, um, to, to, to something, whether it's outside yourself or inside your own DNA. That um, uh, it, it's kind of a little leap of faith or, or or a little leap of trust and 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 see what happens. Mm. That's what I'd suggest. Mm. That's such a great challenge. I'd love for us to do that as a campaign, a three month challenge to do a 10 minutes of something, um, yoga, meditation. I, I personally am maybe midway to a 40 day med meditation challenge, a 21 minute uh, challenge. And my goodness, do you meet resistance and like within yourself, the amount of resistance I have towards that, I meet it every single day and it wants to put me off and it wants to... Uh, but there's these changes that I can't explain why. I can't explain why it happens. There's no research or, I mean, there is research, but in terms of like nothing concrete that I can say, that's for sure what I'm doing, but there's something changing by just sitting for 21 minutes and doing a meditation practice. So um, yeah, awesome words, awesome challenge. Um, 
I just want to thank you for for taking this time today, David. It was really great to hear your story and um, your journey. I think it will really inspire people who take the time to listen, who can have the time to listen to this. And uh, and hopefully it contributes to this change um, where people feel safe enough to begin to take that first step to talk to someone if they're struggling. And I think you've really helped with that today. So thank you. Oh, it's my deep pleasure. And I'm very grateful for the, for the invite and, and I hope it brings some good somewhere. Yes. Thank you.